Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the John F. Kennedy Jr. Forum at the Institute of Politics and the kickoff for Right Here, Right Now, a conservative women's conference. My name is Jennifer Raymond. I'm a senior at the college and your conference chair. Before we get started, I'd like to thank uh, the, Harvard Republic, the rest of the Harvard Republican Club and the CWC, uh, the Institute of Politics, and the Kennedy School's Women in Public Policy program uh, for co-sponsoring this event. The CWC is pleased today to welcome an icon of the American right, Mrs. Phyllis Schlafly. An influential author and founder of the Eagle Forum, Mrs. Schlafly's dedication to principle and untiring efforts to strengthen the country make her an excellent role model for young conservatives. It is the accomplishments of figures like Mrs. Schlafly that inspired the creation of this weekend's conference. Right Here, Right Now is designed to be an opportunity for young conservatives, and especially women, to really focus on what it means to be conservative today. Young conservatives find themselves in a time matched perhaps only by the Reagan era. Conservatism is on the rise, and more and more young people are identifying with its ideals. But some questions, and frankly, some stereotypes remain. Right Here, Right Now aspires to be an event of thoughtful and sincere debate where young conservatives can start to answer the questions and fight the stereotypes. By the end of the weekend, it is our hope that there should be little doubt about two things. First, that not all college women are liberal. And second, that conservatives think and care deeply about what they believe. It is in this spirit that we are so pleased to have Mrs. Schlafly here today as a woman who has stuck to her beliefs and not been afraid to take on the challenge of difficult or unpopular causes. Now, it is also my pleasure to introduce Professor Ruth Weiss. Professor Weiss is Harvard College professor, Martin Peretz Professor of Yiddish Literature, and Professor of Comparative Literature. Please welcome a longtime friend of conservatives here at Harvard, Professor Ruth Weiss. Thank you very much. Well, this is a rare honor for me, and I thank you very much for asking me to introduce Mrs. Schlafly. Uh, we all admire people who stand up to tyranny. Uh, Moses against Pharaoh in the Bible, de Gaulle and the Free French against the Nazis in World War II, Andrei Sakharov in the Soviet Union. Many people believe that there can be no such heroism in democratic countries, given the fact that we have the blessings of freedom and the absence of tyranny. With no oppression, there is nothing to defy. With no threat of state punishment, we are all free to speak our minds. So what courage does it take to express an opinion or to initiate a movement if each and every one of us is entitled to do so? And yet, as you, I think, more than anyone know, um, things are not quite that simple. Democracy creates its own orthodoxies, and within democracies, constituencies form that impose sanctions against ideas that they don't want to hear. Some of us believe, for example, that the so-called free speech movement of the 1960s and 70s was in fact a stop free speech movement. In the name of speaking their minds, students at universities began to specialize in shutting down any speaker who expressed a point of view contrary to theirs, and I think that our speaker has had some experience with this. They used the tactics of intimidation, and many an institution caved in, some immediately and some over the course of time. After a while, you don't even have to employ those tactics. Any group that threatened authority was given its demands. It was precisely in this atmosphere that Phyllis Schlafly, whom I've known only from afar as a public figure, began to speak out. In her own way, she was also a radical. And really from the Latin word radix, for root, in that she was a new kind of conservative, trying to reform the Republican Party from its grassroots. She realized that the country could not proceed with an attitude of business as usual, but that in the face of new internal threats to democracy, it was now necessary to put up an essential fight for American institutions. The title of her first book, A Choice, Not an Echo, gets across this idea that conservatism would have to be freely chosen and newly articulated, not simply inherited. 
Most prominent among the American institutions that needed saving was the family, the basic unit of any society, hence also its most important. Uh, Mrs. Schlafly was a woman of action, and so in 1972, she started a national volunteer organization, Eagle Forum, to lead the pro-family movement. Now, our guest uh, is a very highly educated woman, Phi Beta Kappa from Washington University, graduate of its law school. She also has a master's degree in political science from Harvard. She put these credentials to work Crusading for the Power of the Positive Woman, which is the title of one of her books. In that book, she wrote that whereas the liberationist woman is imprisoned by her own negative view of herself and of her place in the world around her, the positive woman starts with the assumption that the world is her oyster. And here I'm quoting, the positive woman rejoices in the creative capability within her body and the power potential of her mind and spirit. She understands that men and women are different and that those very differences provide the key to her success as a person and fulfillment as a woman. Unfortunately for us, Phyllis Schlafly was not here to remind female faculty of these facts during the assault on President Summers' remarks a year ago. Uh, if only you had been here. If she had been right here back then, then the Harvard debate might have gone a little differently. Uh, Mrs. Schlafly, who defends uh, the use of the term Mrs., has written books on many subjects, including child care and education and phonics, based on her own experience raising children and teaching. She has championed conservative ideas in her radio commentaries, her syndicated columns, and her public appearances on television and in person. And she has been, unquestionably, one of the most influential forces in revitalizing the Republican Party. As one blogger ruefully notes, oddly enough, today it is the Democrats who need their own Phyllis Schlafly to come forward and summon them back to their party principles. Unless Democrats are content to be a party that periodically gets to put their own me tour in the White House, a Democratic president who will govern like a Republican, then they need to offer a choice, not an echo. Well, so far, it hasn't happened. The intellectual and the political energy is still on the conservative side, and its continuing liveliness is due in no small part to our indefatigable guest. I think it turns out that courage is just as necessary in democracies as it ever was under despotic rulers, and Phyllis Schlafly personifies that kind of audacity. We are delighted that she's come to address us right here, right now. Thank you, Professor Weiss. I feel very honored by your very elegant and generous uh, introduction. And thank you, Jennifer, for bringing together this group. Uh, coming to Harvard is kind of like old homecom homecoming for me. On the way over this afternoon, I had the driver drive me past where I used to live, 77 Brattle Street, uh, which is a building, a house that is now over 300 years old. It was 250 years old when I lived in it. Uh, so it's fun to come. I thought I might give you a little perspective about the rise of the conservative grassroots movement in this country, which a lot of people are mystified by. Uh, when I came out of Harvard, and it was completely co-ed when I was here in the graduate school, uh, there were only, so far as I know, three conservative organizations the Foundation for Economic Education, America's Future, and the, and the little American Enterprise Institute. And that is what I joined. It had a little staff of just five or six people. Uh, there wasn't any real conservative movement. Uh, there were a few stalwart uh, Republican senators who spoke out in favor of what we now call conservative principles, uh, such as Bob Taft. Uh, but it was the era of Franklin Roosevelt, the era of the New Deal, when most of the conservatives not only thought they were a shrinking minority, but they were absolutely defeatist 
about the prospect of ever reestablishing uh, conservatism in America. Uh, the, the whole socialist onslaught was considered to be the wave of the future. Uh, we did have the election of 1952 when the Republicans uh, raised their uh, efforts and uh, had the slogan, uh, Corruption, Communism, and Korea. Uh, so uh, they worked hard on that. Uh, but the Eisenhower administration didn't change a whole lot. However, he did appoint the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court, Earl Warren, who ended up having a powerful change uh, in our country. And Eisenhower uh, was later asked, did you make any mistakes while president? He said, yes, two, and they're both sitting on the Supreme Court. Uh, the Supreme Court in my lifetime has built itself into the most powerful branch of government. And it started with Warren, who was the first one to say in a Supreme Court decision that the Supreme Court decision is the supreme law of the land. Now, uh, you read the Constitution and you know that's not true. It is the Constitution itself and the laws made in pursuance thereof uh, that are the supreme law of the land. But uh, many of the evils that we look upon today that conservatives are fighting, uh, such as uh, uh, re the, uh, the decisions against uh, acknowledgement of religion in public places, all started with the Warren Court. Well, during those years of the 1950s and 60s, uh, conservatives were mostly uh, a pro-American underground. Uh, this was an era, you young people should know, before internet, <clears throat> before fax machines, uh, when telephoning was really rather uh, expensive. Uh, one of the things I did was to start study groups. People read in those days. And uh, I developed a study group program based on 10 lessons based on congressional documents about communism. Communism was the great unifying issue of the conservative grassroots in those, er in those uh, years. And at one time, I think we had about 5,000 of these study groups around the country, a program which I, I repackaged for several different organizations using the same materials. People read. Uh, we read the conservative books, and these groups didn't have really any connection with one another, uh, but they were reading the same materials, and they were becoming very well informed as grassroots Americans. They were well informed about the infiltration of communists uh, in our government and in our culture. Uh, they became very informed about the Soviet missile threat which was growing in those years. And then when you think about what one person can do, you can think about Dr. Fred Swartz, an Australian medical doctor who came to this country and organized uh, schools on communism all over the country so that we had a grassroots that was extremely well informed about what communism is and what a threat it is. However, there was still a very defeatist attitude among conservatives. These were the years when Khrushchev said, history is on our side, we will bury you. Those were the years when Whitaker Chambers said, when he left the Communist Party to come over to the other side, he believed that he was leaving the winning side and going over to the losing side. So we all thought we'd pass out our literature, we would inform ourselves, uh, but the tide was going against us. And uh, then all of a sudden, Barry Goldwater appeared. And all of these uh, d disparate little groups all over the country fell into line uh, to support Goldwater for the Republican nomination. The San Francisco Republican National Convention of 1964 was when the conservatives took back the Republican Party from the establishment group, the Country Club Republicans, who had been running it uh, in, uh, in our memory. Now, as we all know, uh, Goldwater went down in a tremendous uh, landslide victory of, of Lyndon B. Johnson, but none of the 27 million people who voted for Goldwater ever regretted doing so. Then we went into the Lyndon Johnson era, and he gave us the Great Society. Again, this was the onward march of everything that was against conservatism. Uh, it was the era when people seemed to believe that the government could solve all of our problems. You have a problem? We'll set up a new government agency and spend more money and raise more taxes, and that will solve the problem. Uh, so that was the heyday of, uh, of, the, of the Lyndon Johnson Great Society. 
Those were the years also when the Soviet missile threat kept growing. And this defeatist psychology even extended to the people who were running our, our military forces. Uh, the, the people who believed that the Soviets were ultimately going to win out uh, in the strategic balance. And that was the issue that I talked and wrote and, and spoke most about in, in the 1950s and 60s. I co-authored five books on the subject of the strategic balance uh, with Rear Admiral Chester Ward. Uh, the, um, the American response was unfortunately again defeatist. Our military policy was directed by uh, Robert McNamara for the eight years of the Kennedy and Johnson administrations and the same policy exactly was carried on by Kissinger in the Nixon administration. And uh, you can best sum it up by the way Admiral Rickover described the Kissinger policy. He believed that the Soviet Union would be the preeminent superpower and that his role was to negotiate the best deal he could for the United States as second best. But many of us never accepted that. And uh, certainly uh, Ronald Reagan never accepted it because he came out of the uh, movement of grassroots conservatism. Uh, but in those years, uh, conservatives thought, well, we made our big effort with Barry Goldwater, and this country is not willing to accept a real conservative. So the best we can do is, uh, is a halfway deal with Richard Nixon. And it took us about two years to realize that that was a bad deal. Uh, and by 1971, most of the real conservatives had already disavowed uh, Richard Nixon because his policies were pretty much the same as the preceding administration. And in this era of defeatism, of grassroots conservatism, then something happened. The feminist movement arrived full-blown. And these feminists had immediate access to all of the media. Uh, they were on all the time, whether it was Gloria Steinem or Betty Friedan and her book, and the media just uh, was doing handsprings about how great uh, this feminist movement was. The feminist movement was preaching the line that women in America are oppressed. They're victims of a male-dominated society. And uh, they needed to have a, an amendment to the Constitution to put women in the Constitution. So they made the uh, Equal Rights Amendment their primary legislative goal. It came out of Congress in 1972 uh, with only nine in the Senate voting no, with only 23 in the House voting no. It had the support of all our presidents, President Nixon, President Ford, President Carter. Actually, when President Carter was in the White House, they ran the campaign right out of the White House itself. And uh, in the first year that it came out, uh, they got 30 states. They only needed 38. So it had a momentum. It had a good name. It had the support of 99% of the media. Only two newspapers in the entire United States ever said a good word uh, for our side against the Equal Rights Amendment. And that was when I took up that battle. This was a real grassroots effort, just as the anti-communist movement had been a grassroots movement to oppose the establishment and everything they were telling us. We started with a little group of women, and of course we didn't get a fair break on the media or with any of the establishment politicians, but there was one place where we did get an equal break, and that was in the, uh, the hearings that were held by the state legislative committees. Most of the state legislators, when they held a hearing, which we talked them into having, uh, they would basically give uh, equal time to both sides. I testified in 41 of those hearings around the country. And frankly, the ERA advocates had no argument. They were never able to come forth and say that the Equal Rights Amendment would do anything at all for women. But we were able to say all the bad things that it would do to women. Now, I had both sons and daughters about your age at this period in my life, and my daughters thought this was the craziest thing they ever heard. You're going to give women a new constitutional amendment, and the very first thing that will happen is we have to go sign up for the draft, like our brothers? You've got to be kidding. This was an unsaleable proposition. Now, you young people are fortunate to live in the post-Reagan era, where you don't have the draft hanging over your heads. But I can tell you, this was a very real threat in the 1970s. We were just coming out of the Vietnam War. 
And uh, you really couldn't sell it to the young women that to get our equality, we need to go register for the draft. And we had a whole list of bad things that the Equal Rights Amendment would do. It would take away all the benefits of the full-time homemaker. And the feminists really hated the full-time homemaker. If you read their literature, you know they set out to make the role of the full-time homemaker economically impossible and socially disdained. And then it began to be clear that their agenda behind the Equal Rights Amendment was same-sex marriages and abortion paid for by the taxpayers. You see, the word used in ERA was not women, it was sex. And if you deny a marriage license to a man and a man, you have clearly discriminated on account of sex. They tried to deny it, but it's clear that's what they were for. And then they developed the idea that since abortion is something that only happens to women, if you deny taxpayer funding for abortions, you are discriminating on account of sex within the meaning of the Equal Rights Amendment. So those were powerful arguments against it. Then there was the argument about Section 2, which would have transferred from the states to the federal government. All those areas that have ever made any difference between men and women, marriage, divorce, child custody, adoptions, school regulations, prison regulations, insurance rates. We didn't want to give the feds any more power than they already had. It was in those years that Ruth Bader Ginsburg, the lawyer for the American uh, Civil Liberties Union, wrote her book, paid for by the taxpayers, describing all the things that ERA will do. And she wrote in that book that ERA would require us to sex integrate prisons and reformatories, fraternities and sororities, the Boy Scouts and the Girl Scouts, that we'd have to reduce the age of sexual consent to 12. And she said uh, that, uh, and she expressed her disdain uh, for the full-time homemaker. Uh, well, at the same time, they, while they would go on television and, say, and cry around about equal pay for equal work, no lawyer ever claimed that ERA would do anything for equal pay for equal work because it wouldn't be true. Our employment laws were already sex neutral. Equal pay for equal work has been the law of the land since before ERA was voted out. So we built a grassroots movement that was able to fight all of those odds against us and able to uh, bring victory. It was a knockdown, drag out battle in many states. Uh, but when you consider the odds against us, it, it is a truly remarkable example of how grassroots action can overcome all the powers that be. And we really did have everything to, against us from the politicians to the media to Hollywood to the money and all up and down the line. But in doing so, in building this movement, we built a whole new part of the conservative movement. Uh, a lot of people didn't understand what we were doing because they thought we were a subset of the conservative movement. It was not. We invented the pro-family movement. We brought people into the political process who had never been there before, who had uh, not had politics as part of their lives at all. And we taught the people from the different churches how to work together. We had the Protestants and the Evangelicals and the Catholics and the Mormons and the Orthodox Jews, people who had never spoken to each other before, had never been in the same room with each other together. And we taught them how to work together for a cause they shared. And this was a whole new element. These are the ones we call the social conservatives who care about the values of life and who cared about the issues that I've mentioned. Uh, and they were brought into it by the campaign against the Equal Rights Amendment. And then in 1980 came Ronald Reagan. And all of a sudden, this candidate was able to have a coalition of the old line Goldwater fiscal strong national defense conservatives and the social conservatives who had come in because they care about marriage, about life, uh, about the values, about family, and so forth. They were different groups of people, but it was uh, the coalition of those two forces uh, that uh, was able to elect Ronald Reagan in 1980. And his election was really uh, a surprise to most conservatives who had spent their time believing conservatives could never win. But it was the grassroots movement that made this possible. And uh, so we, we know that the uh, conservative movement has, has grown and prospered and now it is a major force in our country today. I think the issue that the 
uh, that the um, pro-family, the conservative movement, is most concerned about today is the issue of judicial tyranny. And they have wakened up to the fact that in our life, not in your lifetime, but in my lifetime, uh, the courts have made themselves the most powerful branch of government. They have been legislating from the bench. They have been trying to remake our culture through court order. And this did all start with the regime of Earl Warren. He started by throwing prayer out of the schools, but then it has expanded uh, until now. Uh, you can't have an invocation at a high school graduation. You can't say a prayer before a football game. Uh, you people throwing out the Ten Commandments. And uh, these are issues that everybody can understand. You don't have to be a lawyer to understand this. Uh, it was a Carter-appointed judge who just a few weeks ago threw out the Pledge of Allegiance uh, as a recitation in public schools. Now, the text of the Pledge of Allegiance was unanimously adopted by Congress a half century ago. Millions of kids have said the Pledge of Allegiance every day. The American people like it just the way it is. And to have some Carter-appointed judge out of a clear sky claim that he has just discovered that the words under God are an establishment of religion and he's going to ban the Pledge of Allegiance from the public schools, that's intolerable. That's legislating from the bench. He should not have the authority to do that. And then you look at, at the issue of marriage, which has become a big issue in our country. The people of Nebraska uh, voted uh, um, an amendment to their state constitution upholding traditional marriage and barring same-sex marriage. It was passed by 70% of the people of Nebraska. So you have a federal judge, a Clinton-appointed judge, who simply threw it out. He suddenly discovered that there's something unconstitutional about this. this. These are legislative functions. He had no business doing that. The American people can understand that there's something wrong, something terribly wrong about what's going on. And then take the matter of the Boy Scouts. Most people like the Boy Scouts. The Boy Scouts have been having a jamboree on uh, some military property in Virginia uh, for the last 25 years. This is an event that attracts 40,000 scouts and 300,000 parents and spectators. The president usually goes. So now some, some Clinton-appointed judge in Chicago has now decided they can't have their jamboree anymore because the Boy Scouts raise their right hand and pledge to do their duty to God and country. That's an establishment of religion. The American people are not going to put up with this. And you can go through all the various issues and you can find that many of our problems, maybe most of the problems, are caused by these out of control judges who have convinced themselves that we don't have a written constitution anymore. We have a living and evolving constitution that they can reinterpret and rewrite any way they want to do it. And they're very open about saying that. You look at all the list of things. They've used the First Amendment to authorize uh, any type of pornography. The latest decision uh, on this uh, has uh, said that uh, we, we really can't have any laws against obscenity anymore because that's a violation of the First Amendment. First Amendment is now used to say you kid can't say Pledge of Allegiance in the school, but uh, any type of uh, obscenity can come into your own home on your computer uh, over the internet. That's what the courts have done on that issue. Uh, take the matter of immigration, which is a hot issue today. It, uh, the problem really was started by the courts. Again, one of the Warren Court judges, Brennan, who uh, decided to add a new section to the 14th Amendment and say that uh, the taxpayers have an obligation to provide free public schooling for illegal aliens. Now, there's nothing in the Constitution or any federal law that said that. He made it up. And this, of course, was a tre tremendous invitation uh, to illegal aliens to come in and get all these taxpayer benefits. Uh, take the matter of taxes. If there is anything that should be a legislative function, it's, it's the imposition of taxes. But it was the uh, Warren Court that started out by uh, uh, saying that it was okay for a court to uh, order taxes to put more money into the public schools. And there are now lawsuits in 24 states where they're trying to get judges uh, to order the raising of taxes in order to give more money to the public schools. Now, the people are really understanding these issues. You don't have to be a lawyer to understand that something is askew with our system. And again, it is going to be 
grassroots conservatism, which is addressing this problem. Uh, the American Bar Journal, American Bar Association Journal, just did a survey, and the editors are absolutely shocked to discover that the majority of Americans think the judges are out of control. The majority of Americans think the judges are today unaccountable and arrogant, and when they uh, rule against our values or overturn something that we've had for generations, they should be impeached. And uh, the editors of the American Bar Association couldn't understand this. But this is grassroots conservatism uh, 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 bringing itself to the fore again. The, uh, the remedies that we want will not come from the elite who have been convinced uh, of the idea that whatever some judge says is the law of the land. Uh, grassroots conservatism is going to remedy uh, the problem of the imperial judiciary, and I think that will be the unifying force among conservatives, uh, just as in the, in the 50s and 60s, uh, the anti-communist effort was what brought the grassroots conservatism to the fore. Uh, thank you very much for listening, and I would be happy to take your questions. I think that there are probably many questions. Um, so I'd like to open up the discussion for them. You, there are four microphones, uh, two up in the balconies and two here. And um, would you please introduce yourselves first? And uh, remember that a question has a question mark at the end of it, please. And so please begin. Thank you very much uh, for your remarks. My name is Emily Felt, and I am an MPA candidate here at the Kennedy School. I realize that your organization, at least from your speech, has a strong interest in social issues. Um, on a completely different realm, what are your thoughts on the war in Iraq, Afghanistan, uh, our actions abroad? I thought my, what are my thoughts on the war in Iraq? Yes, ma'am. Uh, I think I'm going to duck that question. Okay. I, it's, I mean, I write about a lot of controversial issues. But I am not an expert on the Middle East or the war in Iraq, and uh, I think I, I'm just going to say uh, I'm, I don't have any helpful information to give you on that subject. Thank you. Uh, hello, my name is uh, Andrew Miller. I'm a student in the college. Um, the speaker who introduced you talked about the fact that during the 1960s, your group was very much a minority, especially in terms of what was being represented in the press, things like that. Don't you think that um, the courts have an important role in protecting uh, minority rights and then if we make uh, our judges accountable to things like impeachment, uh, if they don't represent the values of the majority of Americans, those con constituencies, as your introducer mentioned, could organize to oppress smaller minorities. Your rights to organize were protected by the same freedoms that many uh, justices are now trying to used to protect minorities, just as you were a minority in the 60s. So could you comment a little bit on the role of, of courts as a protector of minority rights? Um, thank you. Well, if you accept the notion that um, the, the court has the last word on these issues, you are stuck with the Dred Scott decision. Now, the Dred Scott decision, who's probably the worst decision in history, um, was a supreme, what I call a supremacist decision. Uh, the court attempted to decide issues that were not before it and attempted to solve a problem that was not their business to solve. And in the course of it said that blacks could not be citizens and uh, they had no rights that the white man needed to respect. Now, Lincoln understood what was wrong with this. Uh, Lincoln said, under our system of government, we have to accept what the, poor, what the court did to Dred Scott. But we do not have to accept the ruling as the law of the land, and we're going to change it. And of course, it had to be changed. Uh, it was changed by a war. It was changed by constitutional amendments. And uh, I think if, you're, if you were specifically addressing the question of, of black minority rights, uh, their uh, savior has not been the courts. Their savior has been uh, the constitutional amendments, 13th, 14th, 15th amendments, plus all of the civil rights uh, laws that were passed. And that's where they got most of their rights, not from the courts. Uh, could you just a little bit, also people with unpopular values uh, also, uh, on minority values. Um, your values were very much in the minority in the 1960s. What about people now who do not share the popular 
um, overwhelmingly popular conservative social value system, not just people with inborn minority traits? Well, first place, I don't know that I was a minority. I, what I said was the conservatives believed they were a, m a minority and they were fighting the wave of the future. Now, I think the majority of the American people were very traditional valued in those years. Now, uh, I, nor do I accept your notion that uh, that it is um, traditional values are a minority today. Mm -hmm. You look at the fantastic passage of uh, these marriage amendments in 18 states. They passed by uh, an average majority of 70 percent, and some of them went as high as uh, 80, 85 percent. And I think that's where the majority of the American people are. Thank you for coming, Mrs. Schlafly. My name's Carolina Adrianska. I'm a first year student at the Kennedy School. You spoke very negatively about the ban of prayer in American schools. Could you please about, talk about what? The ban of prayer oh, in yes. American schools. Could you please talk about your perspectives on the separation of church and state in the United States? The, uh, the ban on prayer in 1963 was widely criticized. Incidentally, it was widely then criticized by the dean of the Harvard Law School, Dean Griswold. Uh, as a case that the Supreme Court never should have taken. This was something that should have been decided at the local school board de level, which was his view on that. It was a simple little non-denominational prayer, Almighty God, we ask your blessings on ourselves, our teachers, our parents. And uh, uh, that was his view, and I think that's, that's correct. The Supreme Court should have stayed out of that. And of course now, when the uh, Supreme Court, when, when the, some of these courts which have thrown out uh, the, the Ten Commandments, um, I think they're really pretty ridiculous. You look at this, this year's uh, court decisions on the Ten Commandments. Uh, there were two cases. Now, the Ten Commandments monument in Texas, uh, the Supreme Court ruled, well, that's okay because the monument's outside the courthouse, and, and because it was put up with a secular motive. It was put up by uh, the Cecil B. DeMille people who were promoting the movie, The Ten Commandments. But now The Ten Commandments in uh, Kentucky, uh, that's inside the courthouse. And we suspect that that was put up with a religious motive. Therefore, that's not okay. And these are these two contrary opinions, just in June this year. And then the, the Supreme Court was stuck with the problem of what about the Ten Commandments depictions that are on the walls of the U.S. Supreme Court? And they got around that by saying, well, we're not going to have those blasted off because uh, you really can't read all the words on the tablets that uh, Moses is carrying. I guess they think we're all too dumb to know what was on the tablets that Moses was carrying. Now, what can you do with decisions like this? I mean, the, the, the Supreme Court should have stayed out of it. Uh, we have every right to have the Ten Commandments, and the idea that that's establishing your religion is, is just wrong. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Chris Beck. I'm a recent graduate of the Kennedy School. Just first a point of clarification. When you're discussing the Democrat judges' decisions, I think it's also important to know that a number of Republican appointees, Justice Kennedy, Potter Stewart, uh, and in Nevada, or, or those judges have made uh, decisions that have overturned conservative viewpoints. And I on certainly the, accept that. It was a, uh, that first Pledge of Allegiance case in 2002 was a Nixon, was a Nixon judge. appointed okay, judge. And certainly nobody's been more critical than I of uh, uh, many of the seven Supreme Court justices who were appointed was, by Republicans. Was just making a plea for balance, that's yes. all. Uh, my question involves um, fiscal issues. Um, how, does, how do the grassroots conservative uh, folks out there, um, how do they deal with the uh, deficits that started escalating during the Reagan years and Bush year, Bush won, uh, turned into surpluses during Democrat uh, administration and have now ballooned uh, into astronomical red ink and uh, uh, with the expansion of the drug benefit bill and the war, and any and absolutely no fiscal discipline to um, deal with our finances, how do uh, how do conservatives that? feel about it? They are very unhappy about it. Uh, they are mumbling and uh, wondering what to do about it. They don't like it a bit, and I would say for the most part they've been kind of um, silent about it because uh, they. Uh, 
uh, voted for Bush, and they thought he was probably better than Kerry. In fact, they were sure he was better than Kerry when they voted for him. And um, they don't know what to do about it. But uh, they're very unhappy about it. They don't like it at all. We don't like the fact that the most expensive education bill in history was passed in this administration. Uh, we're uh, worried about the cost of the Iraq war. We're certainly worried about the cost of these additional uh, added add on to Medicare. Um, um, conservatives who believe in limited government and lower taxes don't like it. Hi, thank you for coming, Mr. Schlafly. My name is Megan Grizzle, and I'm a junior at the college. I'm also the vice chair of this conference. Um, and my question is, how can young conservatives on college campuses such as Harvard, which are very liberal, get involved in grassroots activism? And also, which issues should we be focusing on? Well, you can join some kind of a club, some kind of conservative club, and there, there are a lot of them. Uh, we do have some Eagle Forum collegiate chapters. Uh, there are Republican clubs on most campuses. A lot of them have pro-life clubs. Uh, some of them have conservative clubs. Uh, there are all kinds of clubs. So uh, join up with a group, and then you can, uh, you can have some events. You can uh, set up a table in the yard, Harvard Yard, and invite people to join. Uh, you can protest when, after they've had 10 liberal speakers, you su can suggest maybe they could have a token of one conservative, and uh, s sort of things like that. That's what you can do. Uh, every year we have a, a conference for college students in Washington in June. We had, I think it was our 10th this year, and uh, where we have two days of excellent speeches, um, uh, one day by senators and members of Congress, the other day, maybe we have somebody from the media. We usually try to dig up one uh, conservative professor. And uh, so, uh, so there are all kinds of things you can do. You can also get yourself informed. You can subscribe to the Phyllis Lafley Report, now in its 39th year. And I'll give a plug for my books. I brought a few along. If, uh, everything you want to know about feminism but didn't know how to ask is in Feminist Fantasies. And the easy read on what's wrong with the courts and what to do about it. And uh, what's different about this book is it has remedies. There are other good books on the court, but I, I have solutions. And the solution is for Congress to limit the jurisdiction of the court over those areas where we don't trust them. And I would start off with the Pledge of Allegiance, the Ten Commandments, the Definition of Marriage, and the Boy Scouts. So there are all kinds of things you can do. Get yourself informed. My name is Richie Tiemann. I have no affiliation with this institution of higher learning or any other institution of higher or lower learning, for that matter. <laughs> Ms. Schlafly, I fully understand your response to the first question about Iraq, but with respect to the women, our women who are over there and doing some good things, killing the bad guys, even though most of us probably here do not like the fact that they are so close to the action, there are a number of them who are performing admirably. Would you concede? Do you laud their actions, our female military personnel, and the good that they are doing there with respect to the combat they are engaging in? Well, of course, we admire their heroism and, uh, and what they've done. The women have done some remarkable, heroic things in Iraq. No question about that. And there is definitely a place for women in the military. Uh, I think the American people uh, do not want women put in ground combat. And we have a regulation that says the Army is not supposed to put them in ground combat unless they first notify Congress uh, 90 days ahead of time. And they are skirting that regulation. They are embedding uh, the uh, women along with the men, and I think that is very unfortunate. I think also that the co-ed training is very unfortunate. Uh, doing co-ed training with men and women together is, is ridiculous. Uh, there is no way that women physically can do the same things that men can do. And uh, it's, it's particularly unfortunate when they make the men lie about it and tell us that the, m the women are doing the same as men because they are not. Uh, my name is uh, Sung Moon. I'm a student here at the Kennedy School and at the Business School. I am wondering why, if you are a conservative, you should even bother voting Republican. If you look at the experience of Mr. Bush, the um, domestic spending has gone up by more than Lyndon Johnson. You look at the courts, well, the latest nominee has actually supported things like the International Criminal Court, which a lot of conservatives do not like. Why bother?
is, is the question, why would I bother to vote for Bush if I'm conservative? Because the choice was Bush or Kerry. Well, what else can you say? I mean, it's carried out much different from Bush. I mean, if you look at domestic spending. I mean, or, or, can, or, or, or for instance, if, if Bush is so um, distraught at nominating a potential conservative, you know, well, why? I mean, it's down to one or the other, and, and uh, one of them's going to win, and one's going to lose. So I voted for Bush. Yeah. Hi, my name is Elise Stefanik. I'm a senior at the college. And my question is, when compared to much less developed countries, the U.S. lags behind as far as the numbers of women who serve in elected office, both at the local and national level. Do you think our society should play a role in closing this gap? If so, how? And if not, why not? Uh, I think we have uh, pretty free elections in this country. Women are the majority of voters. If they want more women in office, they can vote more women in office. I certainly don't think we should jimmy the system to make sure that more women w uh, win or that we have a quota of 50% in any uh, legislative or appointing body. I don't think that's the right thing to do. Now, if you ask me why there aren't more women, I can tell you. I have run for office. I ran for Congress twice. And I can tell you that most women do not want to do the things you have to do to run for office. Running for office is a dog's life. You, you have to travel all those miles, you have to shake all those hands, you have to be nice to all those people, you have to answer phone calls all hours of the day and night, you have to eat all those rubber chicken dinners, you have to face the hostile, the hostile press at all hours, and then you have to be away, I mean, if, if you have to be away from home, if you go going to a state capital or to uh, Washington, and there are a limited number of women, women will not do that in the same proportion that men will. And I certainly do not think we should jimmy the system to uh, get a women in positions if they do not voluntarily choose to. I'm uh, Martin Frost. I'm a fellow at the Institute of Politics. And there seems to be a split in the conservative community on President Bush's nomination of my fellow Texan, Harriet Myers, to the Supreme Court. I wonder what your view is of that nomination. Uh, yes, on the nomination of Harriet um, Myers, um, some of the uh, conservatives have, uh, have accepted the argument that they should trust President Bush. And um, I belong in the other camp. I think the argument, trust me, just doesn't carry weight with me. Uh, we trusted Ronald Reagan, and look what we got. We got Kennedy and we got O'Connor. Uh, we trusted uh, Bush one and we got Souter. So I don't think that's a good argument. And uh, yes, you're right, there is a split. However, I do think on the, whole, on the overall issue of dissatisfaction with the court, there is great unanimity uh, among the grassrooters and among the conservatives, and, and, and it extends much beyond conservatives, as that ABA Journal uh, poll shows. It's not just conservatives who think the courts are out of line. Uh, on Harriet Myers, uh, she's 60 years old, and she's never written anything important. And the job of a Supreme Court justice is to write opinions. And she's never written anything on constitutional issues. How do we know? Uh, I, 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 I don't uh, buy this idea of just trusting the president. I, I think there are m probably millions of people in this country. You ask, somebody asked why we voted for Bush. Although people are upset about spending, they're upset about the war, they're upset about 10 other things. Why did they vote for Bush? I think there are millions of people in this country who voted for Bush solely because they believed he would change the direction of the court away from judicial activism and toward a strict, a strict sticking with the U.S. Constitution. And they feel betrayed and discouraged and disillusioned uh, by not getting that. And these two appointments simply do not move us anywhere. Roberts is a good substitute for Rehnquist. No movement. We have no way of having any confidence uh, that Myers is any different from O'Connor. And that answers your question and further answer to the other question. Hi. Uh, my name is Christopher Cox. Um, I'm a sophomore here at the Harvard College. Um, my question is, when you're talking about the Supreme Court, um, you talked about the Dred Scott decision and how you thought it was one of the worst decisions ever to come out of the Supreme Court. But yet, the Dred Scott decision, decision was based on tradition and uh, traditional values of the time period. And at the time period, 
the traditional values were that black people simply were not people. And then later on, um, you know, when we get to the 1960s, uh, you say that, and you know, later decisions, uh, when you're talking about uh, the prayers in school and uh, invocations at graduations, I'm guessing you're talking about cases like Levy Weissman and cases like that. But um, cases where you're saying that judges are going against traditional values by throwing prayer out of schools and by saying you can't have a prayer at graduation, a prayer before a football game. But yet, I mean, in the Dred Scott decision, you were, you were advocating, you were saying that it, was, that it was a bad thing that judges stuck to, to traditional values, whereas now you're asking that judges stick to traditional values. And um, it just seems like a contradiction. Okay, and I, that's a, good, that's a okay, good question. Go I'll be happy. That's a very good question. I'll be happy to explain it. I am not asking for judges to decide for traditional values. I am asking for judges to decide for the Constitution. And you, you're right, the Dred Scott decision was popular among a lot of people when it was handed down. But it didn't stick to the Constitution. The Constitution gives us, the Supreme Court is supposed to handle cases and controversies. And uh, the Supreme Court of the Dred Scott decision declared the law of Congress unconstitutional, which prohibited slavery in the territories. That wasn't the controversy. It wasn't before the court. They had no business doing that. That's what's wrong with it. Uh, it it's, uh, it's not for traditional values reasons. And uh, uh, take, for example, uh, what you might say is another case of traditional values, the Lawrence v. Texas case, where the court threw out the Texas sodomy law. Now, there are only a few states that have sodomy laws. I, I, they haven't had one in Illinois since I can remember. But there was nothing in the Constitution to prohibit Texas from having that. So the Supreme Court called on foreign sources, foreign courts, foreign briefs, and what they called emerging awareness to throw out the Texas law. Now that's the sort of thing that I believe is wrong. I am not asking for a conservative justice or a traditional values judge justice or a justice who goes to church I am asking for somebody who recognizes that uh, their job is to decide cases in accord with the Constitution the way it is written. And as Clarence Thomas once said, when a, when a judge looks at a, a case, he should ask himself, does the Constitution authorize this or does the Constitution forbid it? And when you answer those questions, then you know the answer to your controversy. Hi, my name is Sophie Bessel and I'm a sophomore at the college. And I was just wondering if you had heard of or have any thoughts about the proposed Indiana law to require women to obtain a gestational license before becoming pregnant. And the requirements for the license include um, having to be married and having to state a set of values. And then it's, um, that's the only way that they can get prenatal care. So single women who become pregnant would not be able to. I was wondering if you've heard of this proposal? No, law. I haven't heard of that. Do I don't think it's going anywhere. You okay. don't need to worry. <laughs> okay, thanks. Yeah, you, you can cross that off your worry list. Great, thank you. Hi, yeah, I'm just wondering, um, you talked a lot about Reagan and praised him uh, pretty profusely. Just wondering, what do you think about um, Bush 41 and 43? Have they stuck to you know, the conservative movement or have they strayed from it? Well, Bush 41, um, I think, lost to Clinton because of the unhappiness of the conservative movement uh, that he betrayed his pledge, his read, read my lips, no new taxes pledge. I mean, I just know plenty of people who absolutely would not vote for him again because he betrayed his pledge. We, we expect some type of integrity uh, on uh, uh, an issue of a promise like that. Now, um, um, Bush too is it's a, it's a little more complicated, but I've already expressed myself on on how people feel uh, betrayed uh, in his failure to move the court toward a constitutionalist court. He led us to believe during the uh, campaign that he would appoint judges like Scalia and Thomas, and he hasn't done that, and that's why the conservatives feel uh, very disillusioned. 
Um, my name is Jeffrey Kwan, I'm a freshman at the college. There's been a lot of talk um, at the college uh, of a lot of radical feminists that want to build a women's center on campus, and I was wondering what your reaction to that is, uh, having a women's center here at Harvard. Well, you don't have a women's center here? No, well, we don't. bully for Harvard. <laughs> I hope you don't have a women's center because the, um, most of these women's centers are not women's centers, they are feminist centers. And uh, they, they do not welcome people with views like mine. Uh, I'm sorry, I, 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 I don't think uh, women's studies is a legitimate thing to major in. Uh, it's, uh, uh, they, it, it's the feminist line is to tell women that they're oppressed and mistreated and. Uh, they don't get a fair break, and, and marriage is a dismal uh, uh, career for a woman, and, and uh, it's, uh, it's very unfortunate. I, I think if you wake up in the morning with a chip on your shoulder, you're not going to be successful uh, no matter who you are. And I think w when, when you look back over the 10-year battle that I led against the Equal Rights Amendment, I think one of the reasons that we, we were able to win was the feminists, the, my opponents, did not believe that I could do what I was doing. They do not believe in women's achievement. If they believed in women's achievement, they would be having uh, parties for Condoleezza Rice or Elizabeth Dole or having an, uh, a Margaret Thatcher Award or something like that. They don't do that. They are not for women's achievement. They are for teaching women that uh, society owes you something, you've been deprived of something. And, the, and that's, um, I think, typical of women's studies. They're also very uh, uh, tied up with promoting the gay rights agenda and with a, a promoting ad abortion. And I think that's, that's not intellectual. It's not academic. Let's learn some real history. We just have time for a couple more questions. Please. Um, to segue on women's achievements, um, recently women undergraduates at Harvard had outnumbered male undergraduates. And at the same time, um, a lot of young women are also choosing to raise families instead of pursuing careers. So um, can you perhaps comment on these two um, perhaps different directions for women, um, the pull towards career and the pull towards a stronger family? Uh, yes. Um, these are individual decisions. I, I wouldn't lay down any rule for women in general. But I do think that the most successful ones have been, in the modern parlance, sequential women. And that's really the story of my life. I spent 25 years raising my six children, and then I had time to run around and, and talk to college students and, and write more books and, and uh, do other things. Uh, it's uh, very difficult to do it all at the same time. Now, I have children who've chosen every different possible way, so I know anything's possible. And I grew up in a home where my mother was the principal breadwinner. She was the librarian at the St. Louis Art Museum for 25 years. Uh, you, you, you make your life the way you want to. Um, but uh, I do think that a baby is the most helpless creature on earth, and babies do need tender, loving care. So those are choices you have to make. Life is full of choices. Yeah. Hi, my name is Linda Lee and I'm a student here at Harvard College. And you've touched repeatedly on the Equal Rights Amendment throughout your speech and throughout the question and answer. I was wondering whether you have a belief on what the proper role for women is in society and how you would have dealt with the unequal, unequal employment opportunities and unequal marriage rights if indeed you would have done something to compensate. Um, well, I believe in equal pay for equal work. I don't believe in jimming the system to give women affirmative action or preferential hiring or promotions or other things to achieve a quota in uh, what, uh, to use the common word, a, a category where women may be underrepresented. I don't believe in fixing it like that. Uh, I think that um, there are some jobs that women do better than men, and there are some jobs that men do better than women, and we're entitled to make those differences. I do think men and women are different, and we're entitled to respect that. Um, uh, were you, there was another part to your question. How would you have compensated for the unequal? How the would I? How would you have compensated for the inequality? Instead of the Equal Rights Amendment, what would you have done? Well, if you're looking for a quality of results, I'm not for that. 
I'm for equality of opportunity. Right. I'm for equality of access. But, uh, but when you get around to equality of results, uh, that's not the American way. We believe some people are going to work harder, and uh, some people have different talents, and uh, you're not going to come out with the, with the same result. And, and it's uh, very uh, uh, unfortunate to try to have government do that. Uh, Thank you. Uh, my name is David Fogelson. I'm a second year uh, public policy student here at the Kennedy School. My question is a little bit off of your topic, but one of the more interesting facets of the grassroots conservative movement recently has been the rise of evangelical environmentalism. And I was wondering if you had any comments or opinions on how conservatives might feel about um, you know, this brand of uh, conservative type of environmentalism. Uh, well, I, I don't know what particular um, disputes you might be referring to. Uh, we, we certainly do want to protect the environment. Uh, some of the uh, environmentalists, I think, have uh, done a lot of damage in terms of, of um, private property and uh, delaying other things that we want. Uh, you know, um, uh, one of my solutions for dealing with the activist judiciary is for Congress to withdraw jurisdiction from the federal courts over those areas where we don't trust them. Now, this is something that Congress has done repeatedly, dozens of times, uh, throughout our history. And one of the more recent examples was a law that uh, Senator Tom Daschle put through uh, to take away from the courts jurisdiction to hear any environmentalist challenges to what they are doing for brush clearing in South Dakota. That's the limit of that uh, law, and it's good law today. Nobody's challenged it. So uh, that's just an example of how uh, some people think the environmentalists are causing too much trouble, and uh, you have to have some kind of common sense in dealing with it. All right, well, I uh, will just remind you, I have brought a few copies of my books. They're $20 a piece, one on feminism and one on the courts, uh, which I'll be happy to um, sell to anybody who'd like to. Thank you for your good questions. It's been a real treat for me to be with you today. Thank you very, very much. I think that there's still some time to discuss things um, at a reception back here. I know that some of you were still left wanting to ask questions. I thank you all really for the wonderful questions that you did pose. And I think that this conference uh, is certainly off to a wonderful start. Thank you so very much.